it'll say yes. Tell me yes. Ding, ding, ding. Be sure to let everyone know they are being recorded. You've heard it. Consent, consent, consent. If you don't feel comfortable, bounce. Thank you. Um, and if you have things to say, it will be logged over here in the chat. So make sure you keep it clean and keep it classy. Um, but welcome to Adrenaline Rush. Again, I'm John Nehan. I'm super pumped to be here. Thank you for tuning in. Uh, thank you for Microsoft and for CUE for putting this together. I am honored to be a part of such an amazing lineup of speakers with so many great resources to change the game. We have Ken Sheldon later on today. Uh, Tara Linney uh, is talking about all sorts of really cool stuff. She did some great sessions on Minecraft EDU. Tara's a, Tara's a personal friend outside of the internet. Um, so I'm really just humbled and honored to be here. Uh, I think uh, Michael Cohen is up later on today, educated by design. I just have, these are the people that are like my, I wish I could hang out with them at all times because they make me a better teacher. And I truly think we make each other better teachers. So if on the chat, you want to say anything nice to other teachers, or you want to join in in the conversation, just drop your name in there, your comments in there, and we'll be using that chat feature all session long. I'm now going to throw it on my screen, and we're going to do that bad teacher thing where I just show you a PowerPoint for like the next uh, forever. And then uh, afterwards, we, uh, we we take the conversation um, through the chat. I hope you can see my screen. If you could real quick, can someone say uh, yes, or I see the screen? It should be my bald head over there before the beard. Uh, it's a, it says Adrenaline Rush, game-changing student engagement inspired by theme parks, mud runs, and escape rooms. If you could just say in the chat that you see it, uh, that would be awesome. All right, hold on one second. Not yet. Jacqueline, yes, you will be able to access this recording. All right, I'm going to throw this screen up here. It's going to show you everything. I'm going to click this button one more time. Tell me, tell me, tell me. Let's see. Yes, maybe. Say maybe. Here we are. There's my bald head with my salmon colored shirt. I can tell it wasn't a Wednesday because on Wednesdays I wear pink. That's a true story. Uh, but I'm wearing my adrenaline rush there. Can you just say you see it? I'm going to check over here one more time. Yes. All right. Susan says yes. And if I hear one more person says yes, then I know that we're good. It's not just a fluke. Susan said yes, one more person says yes, new messages. Boom, all right, so says Wendy, so say we all. Let's get into it. Uh, we're talking about game-changing student engagement that's way beyond Jeopardy, one day classroom stuff. We're gonna change the game here. Let's get it going, sir, let's see here. All right, I'm John, I'm excited to be here. I'm an English teacher in Arlington, Virginia at a private Catholic school. If you like today's presentation, feel free to tweet at them. Uh, they are Bishop O'Connell High School um, and let them know we're doing a great job uh, for teachers everywhere. If it's uh, not a presentation that you love today, then I work at another school um, in Virginia and uh, <laughs> uh, don't tell anyone anything. Um, but I'm excited to be here. Thanks to Microsoft and CUE for putting this together um, for the Global Ed Tech Academy. Um, I have office hours this week, I think on Wednesday, if you wanna go deeper or ask any follow-up questions. And likewise, I'm on Twitter at MeehanEDU uh, to talk about whatever you'd like uh, to really help unpack some stuff. And I will hang out today after the chat, though feel free to use the chat feature to talk about any questions you might have. Um, I wrote a book called Adrenaline Rush, all about game-changing student engagement, uh, inspired by theme parks, mud runs, and escape rooms. And um, I have a website, which has every template from everything you'll see in today's presentation. Uh, it's just adrenalinerush.com, just like it's spelled over there. But let's get into it. Let's change the game. Um, this is a thing that I miss most of my school. It's seeing my kids. Uh, I hope you're like me and you're being safe and staying away from people who are not your people right now because this is a very serious time and we don't know what the world's gonna look like in the fall. But I do know that when I am in school, uh, I am excited to talk about what I love. The hardest part is I'm talking about it to people who don't love it nearly as much as I do. And so I, I, I tap into this uh, methodology, this, this mantra um, from Finland. There's an old Finnish proverb and I use it in my book. It says, those things you learn without joy, you will forget easily. I think about those lessons in my own education that I was most excited to be a part of, that were most memorable to me, whether it was when I was um, the winner of a game, uh, maybe on, like on a football field or playing soccer, or whether it was when I was uh, a part of a pre-performance, like um, in the school play or in the Allstate Choir, or whether it was I was part of the school newspaper and I wrote an article that it was for an authentic audience for the whole wide world to see, even if the whole wide world is just my family and my friends. like. For a kid, that was the whole wide world. That was everyone they knew. And they were reading one another's work and they were geeking out over one another's new work. And they find that they put real work in because they see results. And I was so excited to be a part of these things because I felt like it was real. I wasn't geeking out over what tests I took. Even when I got an A on a, on a worksheet, I never went home and said, wow, what a great worksheet that was. I think about those days where I, I walked away laughing and smiling. And I think about every high school movie you've ever seen, right? These cliques of high school kids are very, very like affinity group, group driven and they're laughing together. They're singing together. They're playing together. They're on a sport or a club together. 
And I think that that same spirit can be harnessed in our classrooms. Here are pictures of my kids from O'Connell High School. And you see, like, I have teenagers of all races, all genders, all backgrounds, all sexualities, all religions, um, and different walks of life in, in terms of um, abilities, uh, learning levels, and, and socialization. And they really do come from us from many countries uh, at Bishop O'Connell, even though we do have uh, a lot of students who are predominantly white. Our school is uh, larger than national averages uh, with uh, Black and Hispanic students and students uh, who are international. We have about 20%. Um, so that's huge because there is a universal language that brings people together to play. It breaks down cliques. It breaks down barriers. It breaks down cultures um, that are otherwise artificially bifurcated or divided. And it gets them together and says, hey, you're a kid. Be a kid. I got kids playing dress up. Uh, I got kids playing with Legos in a high school classroom. I got kids playing with story cubes or passing secrets or oversized game boards or uh, interacting with augmented reality on the walls and then learning um, together with people who otherwise they might have not had occasion to mix with. And again, through all of it, they're laughing, they're smiling. And that day is fundamentally different because they showed up, they're able to change the game with their classmates and really feel like a team player as if you're part of that state choir or part of that lacrosse cleat team. You're working together with people. You're laughing together. You're coming together. And yeah, I took pictures of the ones who were most smiley, but I take pictures of my class every day. And if you follow my Twitter account, I do talk about it over and over and over again with happy videos, happy, excited kids who are just telling their stories. And that class is fundamentally altered by virtue of the fact that they showed up and they brought their A game to play. I love this picture here on the bottom left-hand side. I hope you can see it. Um, you can see my students uh, watching the results of a game being uh, given back to them. I guess it was the third period against the fifth period class for which team can score higher on this certain activity. It looks like they're at the World Cup. Look at those hands being thrown in the air, the clapping, the high five. They're turning, they're like geeking out like, oh man, I can't believe we beat them in that. Now they're not competing for grades. They're competing for who can perform better. If you focus on grades, learning suffers. But if you focus on learning, the grades come as a natural consequence. Students are excited. Students are feeling that adrenaline, that dopamine. And then every couple of seconds they're like, this is so cool. They don't realize they're doing a ton of really, really hard work because like a good game, the levels keep getting harder and harder and harder. But that's not because I'm the bad guy. It's because this game against my peers is one where people are really showing up and bringing their best. I love this picture here in the bottom right hand side. I have a student here who's laughing. You can see him with his shaker bottle and his muscles. Uh, that's Eddie. He's an athlete. He's a baseball player for our school. And I believe uh, prior, right prior to um, when we adjourned, he's a, he'll be a senior this year. Uh, he was going to uh, forego his time in college because he is one of the top 200 baseball players in high schools across the country. And he is being uh, recruited to play uh, Major League Baseball. So the plan is for him to, I guess, be drafted for MLB, uh, presuming there is a season. And that, that's going to be his, his career path. Um, he's playing this game and you can see he's, he's laughing pretty heartily. Right next to this uh, student here, Chase. Chase was more my speed uh, for the type of student that I was in, in high school. Chase loves music and theater. Uh, we share an affinity for the Broadway show Dear Evan Hansen. Um, and he's artistic. He's thoughtful. He's quiet. He's very kind. But I'm watching him crack a joke, and I'm watching Eddie laughing. The occasion for these two disparate cliques in high school to come together doesn't really present itself often in a traditional school. You sit in desks. You sit in rows. Maybe you do one team project every couple of quarters, but otherwise you're just pretty much you doing you. Look at how much more these students are coming to see one another, to laugh with one another, to value one another as if they're part of the same collective team. That to me is the heart of this job is we're not teaching content, we're teaching kids, teaching people and letting people see people as people. Now Eddie is rooting for Chase to show to class tomorrow because man, we're working together. That kid's pretty funny, he's pretty clever. I learn in a different way than that student, but that's okay because man, if I didn't hear that thing that he had said, I wouldn't have said that, I wouldn't have thought that. How much more does that break down things like stigmatizing and bullying and self-harm and isolation? Now our students are really coming together and saying, you know what, no matter what happens outside of the classroom, no matter how bad life could be, in this moment I walk into this magic circle, like when you walk into Disney World and the game changes for me. I like to do this with adult learners as well as students. And I did talk about as I came in, um, some of you were coming in late. Um, I lead trainings all over the United States. And if you want to talk afterwards, I'm happy to talk about uh, even how we can do some digital trainings with your school. Um, but I led a training in Winchester, Virginia, where I said, look, teachers, this playful spirit doesn't have to be relegated to Montessori school or just to young children. My mom is a teacher of kindergarten and basic skills. And she's like, John, everything you do is what we did in kindergarten. And my, my kids I'm like, yeah, but people love playing even as they grow up. 
an example that every teacher has to do at one point or another in their life. They hand out a worksheet where a student has to like recap some answers from a numbered worksheet from like, let's say problems one through 20. So I did the same thing with adults. I just took a piece of paper, cut it into strips, put them into plastic Easter eggs. I then took those plastic Easter eggs and I said, all right, as a team, send one representative up. Maybe they're in teams of four or five. Take a person, grab an egg, take it back to your desk group, open it up, solve that numbered problem, write it on your sheet of paper. When you're done, lock it up, drop it back off, rinse and repeat again and again and again and again. How many eggs can you open before time expires on your market set go? I posted the video up online after the training in Winchester, and I didn't think much of it. Um, but then I went to bed, and I woke up the next morning, and I had 10,000 views. And I was like, whoa, well, this, this, this blew up. Uh, and I was like, I think we have something here, especially because those plastic Easter eggs at the time, it was in March, were everywhere at every dollar store, at every grocery store, at every Walmart, every Target. So I said, all right, let's just go ahead and make this a trend and ask other people to try to do the same thing. In a month, it picked up 75,000 views. And I started to see this hashtag egg dash challenge, which was inspired by my classroom, happening all over the United States. I wrote the instructions on my website and I started to see in teachers of littles, you're gonna see these middles, you see these outdoor classes, you see these kindergarten classes. I saw teacher PDs, I saw college levels. I saw kids in private schools in other countries. In fact, I saw people in uh, 40 states across the United States. We kept the track on a big old map, uh, six provinces through Canada and 12 countries throughout the world, including Canada, Canada, Australia, and France, as well as the UK and Ireland. And I was like, well, this is it, right? There's a universal language like we saw in Finland that says the things we learn without joy, we will soon forget. How much joy did I see in these pictures and in these videos of kids geeking out to learn together, to come together, to laugh together, to play together? Because that's the very serious work of childhood. That's, that's actually Fred Rogers. You know, play is the very serious work of childhood. So keeping all this stuff in mind, I was like, well, can we harness that same spirit in our classroom? I have a test for you today. And I'm like, let's do it, even though we are internet. You didn't know you'd be tested, but you signed up for a PD, so sorry. <laughs> um, this one comes to me from an electrical engineer. His name is Mark Rober. He gave a TED talk that I really loved. And he says, I'm gonna give you a keypad here on the left-hand side, and I'm gonna give you a test on the right-hand side. Um, I'm gonna ask you to push button three for five seconds, then button six for one second, button three and five together for six seconds, and so on and so on and so forth. Um, I'm seeing if people have like touch screens, they're probably actually trying to lean in and touch it now. Uh, it's not a one page test though. In fact, it's like a 90 page test. And you're not allowed to go to page two until you have page one 100% correct. If I gave you this test today, first thing in the morning on the East Coast or the West Coast time or Lord knows where internationally, how much would I have to pay you to take this test even though you signed up for this, right? What if we took this test and just presented it with a slight twist? Let's say we called it a game instead. Now, it's not a great game. It's still the same presentation, right? But let's take this game and let's present it like that worksheet in an unconventional way. Take that, quote, test, turn it into a, quote, game, where now we turn it sideways and said, all right, now can you do it? Maybe you took this, quote, test or this game and you posted it underneath the desks in your classroom. Now students were spelunking caves or exploring the Sistine Chapel and they had to solve it by leaning on their backs and trying to see what they can solve, right? Um, or you cut up in strips, put them in Easter eggs. And in this case, uh, he says, let's take this keypad and rearrange those buttons. Same six buttons, just in a different configuration. And let's add a little bit of a paint job on it, a little bit of a story to them too, rather than Easter eggs. Now we've hidden things inside of a paint job. Take that same test, and instead of the written prompts we used to have, now we get as visual prompts. And ask that same question. How much uh, would I have to pay you to take this test? Or more directly, how much would you pay me now to do the same thing? Because it is the same thing. Games and tests, are the same and our kids when they go home play video games forever and video games are hard. They fail and they die as a hazard of the game. They expect to get blown up in Minecraft or in Fortnite or in Mario Kart and they die pretty routinely, pretty regularly. But then they come back to our classrooms, lose one life, so to speak, right? Get one math problem wrong, throw their hands up and they say, oh, I'm not a math person, I can't do it. Yet they'll get killed in Fortnite 40 times for the privilege to play that game again. So could we tap into that spirit of playful learning that we see in theme parks, mud runs, escape rooms, in this case, video games, to get people excited that it's okay to try and fail again. It's in fact safe. It would be a, a bad PD if I did not give you a good acronym. So here's our acronym for the day. If you take nothing else away, good games are precision engineered feedback machines. They offer specific actionable feedback that's delivered expediently. When you play Mario, you run, you fall in the hole, and you get another life, and you do it again. Rinse and repeat again and again. 
Same works with the theme parks, the mud runs, and the escape room. Your students freak out about that roller coaster. They don't want to do it. They don't want to do it. They don't want to do it. They get on that roller coaster, and immediately they turn to you and they say, Mom, can we go again? Right? You do that escape room, and you're like, I don't know if I have the right answer. They're fiddling with the locks. They see the music blowing away. The sounds are tick, 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 and they're freaking out. They bust the lock, and they're like, oh, and into the next room they go. Specific, actionable feedback delivered expediently. That's not the same as our classrooms, unfortunately. Traditional classrooms collect a pile of essays once every two weeks, once every three weeks. Then we, as a teacher, take it home and have one or two or three or four glasses or five bottles of wine while we grade that big stack of papers. And then three weeks later, to students and say, here's what you did three weeks ago. They completely forgot. They might have written it on the bus. There's no speed. There's no accountability. And so they forget and they move away. How can we expedite our feedback systems in our classrooms to create opportunities where it is okay to fail? Unless we think that this is just some sort of geeky uh, video game thing, it's not. It, the, the science behind how and why this works dates way back to the earliest days of antiquity. Uh, this comes to us from a, uh, a researcher. His name is uh, Josef Pieper. He's a German philosopher in the middle of the 1900s uh, who's, who's since passed away. But he is the uh, preeminent scholar of the 1900s on St. Thomas Aquinas who, and my family is Catholic, my, my school is Catholic, the Catholic tradition reveres St. Thomas Aquinas because he is the reason why we go to Aristotle and Socrates because of all of the people like the original church fathers. He dips back into antiquity even before that time and says, this is what learning is supposed to have been. In fact, in Pieper's book, Leisure is the Basis of Culture, he says, the things that we get to do happen in the leisure world. The things that we had to do, he calls them the work a day world. And he notices, which is really beautiful, the leisure in Greek comes first from the word scholae, and in Latin, the word scala. The English word school is used to designate the place where we educate and teach. And it literally is derived from the word that means leisure. When there is a war, we fight a war because it's what we have to do, not because we want to do. And that war is fought to preserve our way of life. And when we say our way of life, we talk about our value systems, our freedoms, our hopes, our aspirations, our dreams, our, our art, our music. Like our freedoms to just be the type of people that we are. That's that leisure thing. That's the thing we don't have to do. Yet somewhere along the way, our schools felt the need to be so super serious. And maybe it's at the time of like the industrial revolution that we started grading children as if they were meat through a grinder. We're pushing them through in assembly lines as if they are here, sit down, shut up, take the medicine, and on you go. And I wonder if we could reclaim this ancient purpose of play through things that students are excited about. So let's talk about it, play, and we'll have an actual quiz uh, for real, for real, this one. Um, this one comes to us from a book called The Game Believes in You, How Digital Play Can Make Our Kids Smarter uh, by a man named Greg Topo. Greg is the national K-12 education reporter for about 20 years uh, for USA Today. And he has since gone on to be the managing editor, I believe, at the Chronicle of Higher Education. So he is uh, no joke. He knows his stuff when it comes to, to education. He was a former teacher himself before he got into journalism. Um, in his book, The Game Believes in You, he talks about how technologies really can change the game, but that technology is a bit of a misnomer. He uses the piano as an example. He says, for people who are born, when a technology comes out, we call it a technology. Wow, look at this fancy new Xbox, this new PlayStation, this new piano. But for people who have lived only after that technology was invented, we just call it a tool. Right? You would never sit down at your piano today and be like, I'm sorry, I can't talk to you guys now. I have to go play with my technology. You wouldn't. It's an instrument. It's a tool. And in fact, the piano is not so different than video games. With enough time and enough patience, you can get just as good as Mozart. You push the wrong key, it tells you the wrong sound. Then you have a chance to practice it again. Tapo suggests in his book that games are infinitely patient and infinitely stupid. Unfortunately, teachers don't have infinite time and we have limited patience, right? So when we're listening to kids and working with kids, like, ah, oh, we just gotta get through this. But games don't care if it takes you two, three, five, or 10 times. Practice and fail and do it again, do it again, do it again. They're precision engineered feedback, feedback machines. So looking at old school video games, I'm talking way back like early arcade games, old school Mario Brothers, Mega Man, uh, Legend of Zelda. There is an intended rate of failure when they design video games um, that they kind of want you to fail a certain amount of times. Now, we will have a chance to chime in on the chat about the failure rate here. The question is, what do we think that intended rate of failure is? Keeping in mind that if you fail too often, you're going to take your control and throw it across the room. But if you don't fail enough, like if you walked up to casino and pushed a button and says, push here to win, then there's no payout, right? Because there's no risk. 
What do you think that failure rate is in that old school video game? And we'll put it from 0% to 100% on a first playthrough. If 0% failure is everyone who plays passes every time. And 100% failure is everyone who plays is going to die the first time. What do we think that failure rate is for the average player between 0%? Again, everyone passes. And 100% failure, everyone fails. And go ahead and use that chat feature um, here in the forum. I'll take a look. I'd love to hear your thoughts. And I will come back to the presentation presently. But I wanted to see what you have to say. Uh, so our failure rates, let's see what we have here. I'm seeing 20%, 50%, 60%, 70%. Angie says 83%. Ooh, ah. um, Jackie says 30%. Someone's going to say $1 like Price is Right uh, <laughs> or beat it by only a penny. Um, this is interesting. I'm seeing all these, these things here. I'm, like, I'm running the numbers real quick. Becca says 75%. Uh, these failure rates are pretty high. Uh, Kathleen says 85 uh, If you built a test and you said, good news, principal, 85% uh, of my kids failed it. You would not be working at that school after two or three days, right? You'd be working at Starbucks because they would not have a teacher who gleefully rubs it in that four or five kids out of five or six kids fail. Um, let's look at the actual retail price over here. I'll hop back to the dock. Um, actual retail price, you see it right there on the big one. 80% failure rate. When they design games for an old school difficulty, they want four out of five people to fail. Isn't that crazy? Games are designed to be really, really hard. There's a whole graduate program in the University of Michigan that studied to the science of what they call gamification, which is how we use elements of play borrowed from things that are traditional games to just make the life more interesting, more engaging, more marketable, more better. -er. And average price of failure in the world outside of games is only like 23%. Games are actually three times harder. You're almost like three times more likely to fail a game than you are to fail in life. So why is it that our kids geek out about theme parks, mud runs, escape rooms, video games, when they're so much harder? I think the answer lies in that idea of how they tap into positive psychology and this idea of what we call the flow state. This comes to us from a researcher from Europe. His name is Mihai Chiksen Mihai. We talked to us about the psychology of play and why it works, because we tap into what we call a flow state. On this graph here, on the left-hand side, talk about the challenge level. On the right-hand side, the skill level. If a child comes into a classroom and is feeling very low skill, but very high challenged, they usually respond with anxiety. They're freaking out. They don't understand it. They start to feel dumb. Meanwhile, if a child is really, really high skilled, but uh, the challenge is very low, well, then the child, there's a good chance they're gonna feel relaxed to the part point of apathy. But what good games do is reward you with harder challenges each time you beat that last level. So if you have your own children, you've probably seen that moment where like, mom, one more level, dad, 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 just one more man until I die or until I fall down this next hole or until I hit the next safe spot because they're ramping up the challenges constantly as your skill level improves. And as you get to that new level, you earn a new power or you earn a new ability. And you kind of want to say, I've just gone up from junior varsity to varsity, now from varsity to college, now from college to the, you know, the minor leagues. Now I'm going to get to the pros. And you start to lean in because the challenge gets harder as your skill gets stronger. If you're in that flow state, you hit this time speed up and slow down paradox where you kind of forget to eat, you forget to sleep, you forget to do any chores around the house, forget to use the restroom because you're fully in that state of everything is happening and I lose track of time. That's what I want to see in our classroom. So how do we do it? Uh, I think the answer to us in today's presentation, I've been broken out of three parts, uh, comes to the sense of student motivation. In the great book, Drive, uh, Daniel Pink uh, talks about the surprising truth about what motivates us. He says that carrots and sticks don't work either because your student is not hungry for that carrot or they don't fear the stick that you wield. If you've done a traditional game like Jeopardy in class, you probably put in a ton of work to put that whole thing together. But somewhere along the way, a kid realizes, oops, only the smart kids are gonna get the answers, right? Well, I can't win, so I'm out. They don't fear your stick, right? Or you say, hey, the winning team gets candy. Kid pulls a candy bar out of his pocket and is like, look at this. Now I don't need to play your stupid game. They're not hungry for your carrot, right? So in Pink's book, he says, motivation of a traditional extrinsic sense is passe. The carrots and sticks don't work. It works for like 15% of kids, but 85% of people will be left in the dust because they realize they can't win. It's the same reason why top seller programs in organizations um, typically fall flat because most people realize they're never going to be in the top, so why bother trying? Instead, Pink suggests that if you want to get people amped up, if you want to get them to care, you have to hit their heart 
have to hit their mind and you have to hit them in, intrinsically. And he says that good games, good playful systems, good motivating uh, organizations tap into a sense of autonomy, provide mastery, and they deliver a sense of purpose. And I want to talk about the traditional game of school very quickly, because the traditional game of school fails in all three of these categories. The traditional game of school is, I have to give these kids homework because reasons. So you give them homework every night for each of 10 nights, and then they take a test every two weeks. And because you gave them homework and they got a test, you give uh, you know the average of those grades, and that's the grade for the quarter. And then they move on to the next unit, unit two, unit three, unit four. We know darn well if we give homework to every kid and we don't grade it, well, then they're not going to do it. So we start giving 10 points a night for homework, but then they just start copying one another's homework. And then they get to that test every two weeks with 100 free points in the bank. They take that test and they get a 60 because they didn't learn anything over the last two weeks. Then we say, well, Billy, you had good homework. You just need to study harder. And he takes a 60, averaged out with 100. He gets a B minus an 80 and we move on to unit number two, rinse and repeat. And that's our school year. For our students, there's no autonomy, there's no mastery, and there's very little purpose through any of this. If a child has 100% in your classroom, then why do they have the same homework as a child with 0% in your classroom? If a child is failing your classroom, then why are they being asked to do homework where they teach themselves a thing when they're probably making those same mistakes again and again? For the first, there's no autonomy. For the second, there's no mastery. And ultimately, if they know that they can do nothing for two weeks and average it out with you giving that test and doing that mathematical sleight of hand, or maybe bring an extra bit of hand sanitizer so they can get five more points. Well, then there's no purpose to any of that learning. How do we get our classes fired up to change the game, that flow state, that autonomy, mastery, and purpose, to really tap into that leisure spirit of the things that we learn without joy become soon forgotten, making our classes more fun? So I'm going to talk about autonomy, mastery, and purpose right on full display here with examples from my own classroom. And the rest of today's presentation will break into three parts. First, we'll talk about autonomy then mastery and purpose. Um, we'll spend most of our time here on autonomy to start. If you've ever played a video game like Mario Kart, you probably have your favorite player. Uh, maybe you're a Mario guy. Yeah, wahoo, right? Or maybe you love Peach or Yoshi. And even Yoshi, you have your favorite color Yoshi, blue Yoshi versus pink Yoshi. Um, there's no functional difference between these, these racers. I realize people who are really geeky are like, that's not true. Luigi is 4% faster. Okay, fine. Um, but you get fired up if someone takes your guy. The same happens in Monopoly. Uh, you have all these different pieces. That's the first choice you get to make. Hey, did you consent to playing? Cool. Which of these playing pieces would you like more than other pieces? There's no difference between the hat and the car. The car doesn't get to move five extra spaces because it's a car while the hat has to stay because it's a heavier piece. There's just a chance to make a choice early and get in the game. And those choices really don't make much of a difference except for to say this game allows you to make choices. So here we go. Talking about autonomy here. Early in my school year, I know I have a full year of American literature. I teach 200 years of American literature. I'm sorry, 400 years of American literature. Starts in the 1600s and ends in the 2000s. And I have a lot of content to cover. Way back from the Puritans, stories of like the Scarlet Letter, Hester Prynne, all the way up through stories of the Harlem Renaissance, stories like Their Eyes Are Watching God and Zora Neale Hurston, contemporary literature, things like Ernest Hemingway, the American classics like Huckleberry Finn. That's a lot of content to cover. So if I could have that sense of autonomy where my students feel like this isn't being fed to them, Rather, it's being presented like Easter eggs that they must discover things. Well, perhaps I could hook their attention. So I presented my class as if it's a 400-year race for the American dream. And because it's racing for a dream, I called it the dream rush. Now we are explorers in a brand new land of American literature. And together, we have to understand who has this dream, who stole this dream, who has access to this dream? Who's, who's losing this dream? Is it fundamentally accessible to all people? And in each unit, we'll be telling little pieces of story to unwind our whole year narrative that we as time travelers can go through 400 years of content, again, just a new coat of paint on it, and together, rather than reading these books, we're going to live these books. They're going to come to life. Now, I realize that's a little bit of hype and marketing, and yeah, that's part of it, but I want to tap into that imaginative sense of play that my students immediately see themselves as players in this game rather than passive receptors on the bench watching it. So thankfully, with uh, 36 weeks of content, I have about 12 units. Each one takes about three weeks to move through. Um, I just have the stories that I rip off the theme right from the books that we're going to read. So when we read uh, Ernest Hemingway, for example, now we're in a war zone. Or when we're uh, reading the story of Huckleberry Finn, now we're on the Mississippi River, for example. But the brain is really good at keeping different stories separate. And the easiest example I would point to anybody is if you're watching Netflix, you probably can watch Breaking Bad and also be watching The Office. And at no time do you believe that Dwight might be in trouble because someone is going to 
get him caught with crystal meth, right? There's this brain has a cognitive dissonance that stories exist in their own little bubble, their own sort of magic circle. Walt Disney World works the same way. When you walk into the Haunted Mansion, it's the spooky place. When you walk into Cinderella Castle, it's the charming place. When you go to the Jungle Cruise, it's the adventure place. Each of these themed worlds has its own set of rules independent of one another. So as an American literature teacher, I take those things and I amplify them as the, for the next three weeks, we'll be playing this, quote, game where all of us are working together to make sense of this very difficult subject matter. Now, as an English teacher, it's easy for me because it's been provided by the books that we have to read. But if you're a science teacher, you can do the same thing. Level one could be we've crash landed on an alien planet and we don't know if there's intelligent signs of life here. Now it becomes a biology unit where we have to explore things under microscopes. Just that little bit of a twist, right? Now students are seeing themselves as terraformers or bio, bio, uh, biological researchers on a brand new alien planet. Then unit two is, okay, we've collected our samples, but we need to blast off. It becomes a physics unit. Now we have to turn our, our, our ship into something that's space bound. So talking about uh, drag, drive, drum, um, I'm sorry, real quick, someone seems to have a microphone on and it's popping. Uh, if you could just mute, I, I appreciate it. Um, I'm sorry, I'll, I'll hold a second. If yours is that microphone, I just gotta, I think we're good. Awesome, thanks. Um, nope. Sorry, yeah, it sounds like someone has a spoon in the background having coffee maybe. Uh, it just keeps slamming in the ears. Um, so as we're moving through uh, different units, and thank you again, I appreciate it. The, the sense that we are in that magic circle, and I use that uh, story to really help them feel suspended in animation. In Disney World, you don't see people from space land when you're in adventure land, right? All the space people stay in the space zone. And our brain makes sense of that because it has a really good sense of, there's an internal story of whether it's Mario Brothers or yeah, Breaking Bad or um, the world of the Forbidden Woods in this case. Um, and and I, I use the example of the interruptions uh, in, the, in the hallway or in this case, like uh, over the internet, there's, there's a magic when you're in a space that you kind of get pulled out of when you have those sort of chimes or those distractions. So if I could create an immersive space where students are just, hey, when you're here, we're just doing Huck Finn. We're just doing uh, The Forbidden Wood. And so I think that's really, really important to try to lock kids into this world that makes sense with its own clear sense of rules. Um, I'm really sorry, the person who has that, that microphone on, it's, 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 it's still popping. I apologize in advance to anybody who's, who's hearing that over the top. I'm gonna try to keep, keep plowing ahead. Um, so as we're exploring this dream rush race for the American dream, on the first day of class, I want my kids to get excited. I want them to blast off through what's going to be 400 years of content, and I know I have a lot of stuff to cover. But here's the deal. On those first days, I know it's the grind where I have to sign them up for text alerts and take you know, permission slips and take uh, a bit of about me surveys and all of that stuff. It takes for forever. So instead of walking through that, hello, my name is Mr. Meehan. We're going to be racing for an American dream this year. Won't it be fun? Because that's what traditional school would have been. I take that egg dash challenge and present it to them like so. Here in our classroom, we're about to blast off into space, guys. I'm so excited. We have 400 years of time travel to happen. You need to fill up your spaceships, your time travel machines, because we're going to blast off in 90 minutes. And in 90 minutes, we're ready to go. You have to sign up for all of these different things, but I don't care the order in which you sign up for them. Whether you need to follow a web quest or a forms from Microsoft, a graphic organizer, fill out a short flip grid, a Padlet, sign up for text alerts through Remind, make a small uh, group meeting, a sketch note, et cetera, et cetera. Don't care the order in which you do them, but you can divide it into teams, red team, blue team, green team, orange team. Work as a team, pick any one of these 10 centers. When you think you have the right answer, call me over. If you're good, nice work and you're moving on. If you're wrong, like a video game, you're stuck there, but the other teams are gonna keep moving on. Which team can load up their rocket ships first? Well, here we go. Now our dream rush again is talking about people and not about content. This one happens to be around a space race, but you can see it's the egg dash challenge just by a different name, right? We're not teaching content, we're using content to teach people. And so tapping into those imaginative, playful stories, that sense of autonomy, I made the menu. I know they have to sign up for all 10 things, but I don't care whether the average person goes on Space Mountain before they go on Big Thunder Mountain. They have the choice of this uh, theme park to go wherever they need to go and to tap into things that are most of interest to them in the order that makes most sense to them. So every student will be given something like this. Um, it's a piece of paper that says, all right, you have no idea how to fill this out. The instructions are scattered at each of those 10 locations around the classroom. And I'll do it as like printed sheets on the wall that's hooked with magnets to the big board. They'll then take it back to the desk group and oh, we're working on this one. Okay, fine. So at this first station over here, maybe they have to fill out uh, a journal. And in the journal process, my goal is to become a better public speaker. Um, 
that student has to write two or three sentences in order to get that journal thing complete. They can talk to each other gladly. Sure, talk to your teammates, but I need to see your individual goals because that's what the journal station was for. All right, that's your captain's log and now we're blasting off. Cross that off your list and you move it on. At another station yet, maybe they're taking a small about me survey where I get to know the type of player that they are. Even though learning styles are largely overrated and pseudoscientific, it does help me to see a sense of how they see themselves. Are you a visual learner? Are you an auditory learner? Do you learn by teamwork, by group work, et cetera, et cetera? In a third station yet, I'll have them create a player profile here on the left-hand side where they'll uh, make a hex graph and they'll rank their own skills on a scale of one to six, but they're only allowed one thing that's first place, then second, then third, then fourth, then fifth, and sixth. Okay, if we're a gamer or a speaker, a reader, a writer, a tech person or a social person, which one are you strongest at? Back and forth we go. How much more do I know every student by what I see here, what they turn in, rather than me saying, oh, so you think you're a reader, huh? Or we play two truths and a lie. Each student is turning this work in and I get to collect it at the end of this big game. I have rich data on how to work with the students in my classroom. I understand them as people and I'm able to tap into the things that they care about for their continued levels of play. Talking about dream rush and here it is, like this is the egg dash challenge and I just have an overhead scoreboard where I'm crossing off how many teams are getting which ones won. So the beauty of this is they can see one another and see themselves in competition with one another. And I don't care whether they're filling out station one before station seven, because in the end, we still have 90 minutes to play over the first two or three days of school. And the rule is whatever stations you did not get done as a group become immediate individual homework for you as an individual. Well, now there's a sense of like urgency there, right? They can see, oh, the gray team is doing well. We're falling behind. That's a problem. So yellow team might step it up. But meanwhile, I, as a teacher, if I see a team racing way too far ahead, like Monopoly or Mario Kart, it's not fun when someone beats you to the point where it's way like a blowout. So instead, if I check in with the gray team and they're doing really, really good, maybe I ask a few more clarifying questions to slow their pace down just ever so slightly. It helps like a rubber band to bring the game back in. So at no point becomes a dead runaway and that scoreboard is always closed. So everybody's always finishing at just about the same time. And if they're not finding themselves raising ahead and they're falling behind, then I come over and I say, oh, yellow team's falling behind. Maybe they need a few attaboys or a little bit more proximity control to make sure that they stay on task. It's fast, it's fun. And in the end, over two or three days, they've signed up for all of those things I've asked them to do, even if they did it in a totally different order than this team next to them. And that's okay. In Doug Limo's book, Teach Like a Champion 2.0, he says, you know, you can't give carrots and sticks. He says, the reward for right answers always has to be harder questions. So that when you're done learning, you're never done learning. Learning never stops. There's always a new challenge. Um, and I think in my classroom, I try to capture the same thing. So there's always enrichment activities, like a Montessori school. If you're done with thing X, nice work. You've earned the right to level up on a thing Y. Again, like we talked about flow state. What does that look like for autonomy? Maybe if they finish a station early, and I'll see examples in my class where let's say we're working on something with the Great Gatsby, their group or their team finishes early, I'll give them a bag of Legos and I'll say, can you build me uh, what we read last night out of Legos? And just take pictures of it and put it in a PowerPoint. Go. What? Like, I don't know what they're gonna say. It's annotation exercises. But when they start to construct things, that very constructivist uh, approach was again, very Montessori. Well, if they're looking for the green brick, they're not looking for the blue brick. They know specifically that I need a green brick. No, nope, it needs to be green. It needs to be green. It needs to be green. And they're building their vision of what a thing looked like. You can use this at home. Hey guys, build anything around your house. Uh, but use whatever supplies you have to tell me the story of what we read last night. Make me a PowerPoint slide with five slides where you make the annotations there on the right hand side. Talking about right and left brain uh, connections here. They're making sense of what they read and what they saw in their mind's eye. How much more richly is this very high level engagement being tapped into because they had a chance to tell me their version of what they saw instead of my multiple choice answers for what I asked of them. I love the idea of coming from creativity here. One of my favorite toys and tools is called Rory Story Cubes. There's an app, I think it's called Story Cubes or Story Dice. Um, you can do the same thing. Uh, I think the app is free or maybe a dollar or two. Uh, but Story Cubes are fantastic. They look just like this, a small dice, uh, a set of nine, and they have different themes. They have um, like a Batman theme, a Scooby-Doo theme, they have a Star Wars theme, uh, and then just have the generic ones, horror movie theme or whatever it is. You roll the dice and you're expected to tell a story where you incorporate each of those images. Okay, fine. I'll put that into a classroom game and I'll say, all right, team, roll the dice and tell me the story of what we read last night in The Great Gatsby. Go. What? Like, there's no bumblebees in The Great Gatsby. There's no cell phones in The Great Gatsby. Sudden, suddenly students start to talk about metaphorical connections. They're like, well, he got stung 
by love. Ooh, uh huh. Right. And uh, his cell phone would be because he's he's very image obsessed, like the type of person who has like a social media profile to attract people to his parties. They're making really high level evaluation and creation. And they're talking to one another and laughing with one another about how do we incorporate every last piece of this puzzle? Again, I don't know what the right answer is. It's coming from them. It's not coming from me. And in a game, I could say, all right, each team gets a deck of story cubes. Hey, blue team, you fell behind yesterday. Why don't you assign which team gets which deck? The team that was, quote, the smart kids. Now they have the Batman story deck because it's way hard to tell the story of the Great Gatsby and use the Joker and the Riddler. But maybe they feel more safe if they can start with, I don't know, the Scooby-Doo theme, whatever it looks like. There's no can functional can difference. Can lock the door in the front? Hi, I'm sorry. I'm hearing somebody talking who's asking to lock the door. Can you just mute? Oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> oh, it's okay. Uh, it happens. Um, so students get really excited because they're playing against one another. And as they play against one another, they're excited to see what they can come up with that beats the other team. But it's like, whose line is it anyway? I don't know who's going to win. The games are made up and the points don't matter. But they're leaning in that much more closely, paying that much more attention and feeling rewarded with harder questions because that feels fair intrinsically that the game is adjusting different levels to meet their skill set. We'll do something like the Scarlet Letter. And I make this feel like a game of Dungeons and Dragons. And if you look at it, just the picture of it alone, you walked in there's spooky music. That's it, right? Our today's kids love uh, the geek culture of Stranger Things. They can't get enough of it. And the Stranger Thing Things kids play Dungeons and Dragons. Even if the kids have never played Dungeons and Dragons, they're familiar with a thing called Dungeons and Dragons. So could I turn an entire unit of a novel study into uh, a themed like Dungeons and Dragons style campaign where they're competing as different guilds to make sense of, this is a story about going into the woods and being possessed by the devil. Isn't that the same thing as the Dungeons and Dragons campaign? Okay, they'll come into class, first day. There's spooky music playing in the background. Maybe they're expected to read chapter one of the book before they came in. Traditional class would give them what I call a DIRT test, D-I-R-T. Did you read this? And unfortunately, if they did read it, that doesn't mean they're going to pass that test because they might have just been a bad test taker. And even if they didn't read the test, they might still pass that test because they just cliff noted it or a kid gave them the answers in third period. So instead of a DIRT test, which teaches me nothing, I ask them something a little bit more honest, honest or playful and authentic. Here's the, uh, the summary of chapter one. You find yourself in Puritan Boston. It's 1642. You're with your guild. And there's a scandal in a religious society. A married woman named Hester Prynne is on the scaffold in her crime uh, in the center of town. She has a baby out of wedlock, and she's not saying who the daddy is. What would you do as a team if you were in this situation? I give away what happened last night because I'm going to ask them to give me back something that is a much higher, harder level. Question one. Uh, well, I'm going to join in the conversation because she's a sinner and she deserves to be shamed. That's what they would have done in the 1600s. You know, maybe you want to do the medium thing. Hey, I don't know. Let's just play it, play it safe, play it easy here. Or maybe we're going to do the hard thing. No, we need to speak out. There's some injustice here and this is not right. That's private business, not our public matter. I'll let them talk to one another as a team. Brainstorm. Which choice do you want to make? Like Dungeons and Dragons. You came to the woods. You see an elf. Do you go left? Do you go right? Do you take his gold? They make a calculated risk reward. They make a decision. And then as a team, I say, all right, which one do you want to come up with? Maybe we have a small debate or an in-class share out. Or maybe I say, all right, send a representative up and scan this QR code. This QR code now takes us to a Microsoft form. And that form is length validated depending on the selection that they've chosen. So if they pick the easy thing, okay, congratulations. You've unlocked the easiest puzzle of all because it was so easy. Can you just go ahead and tell me what happened in the book? Uh, and give me examples of why you would do what you did. Um, just go ahead and put in at least 300 characters because it's the easy thing. That should be really easy. There's tons of text evidence that would bear that out, right? If they go the medium route, hey, I don't want to know what I'm going to say. Okay, same form. Now it says, congratulations, you've unlocked the medium. Can you give me 200 characters to explain why you made this slightly harder choice? And again, text evidence to bear it out, just like we saw with that great Gatsby uh, annotation. Either way, they're going back to their book and bringing in text evidence, right? And the hard thing says, wow, you picked a really difficult thing. Not a lot of people in that time would have done that. Okay, can you tell me why you would do that versus what they did? Can I get 100 characters uh, to bear that one out? And again, in each of these situations, they still have to put in a certain amount of text characters or the form will not let them submit it. That's brilliant because there's an equity to it and there's an autonomy that they chose the easy or the medium or the hard. And they know that there's a lot of text evidence or they don't wanna work so hard or they have no text evidence, but they really feel passionately about it. And they're talking to one another and they can't submit those forms until they have all of that stuff put in. I love that. It's a great way to start off any class because then I can tell really quickly who finished the book, who read the book and who has no idea what they're talking about while I'm sort of floating around. Now, once they're done, they've unlocked as the right a team to compete in a full day, sort of like Montessori style challenge. There are eight different stations or seven different stations you can choose from. 
Like I said, the menu is all healthy food. I don't care which one you pick. Blue team, you did great. Uh, you're the first team through. Which of these stations do you want to uh, do today? Do you want to play with Legos for all of today's class? Would you like to just sketch note? Would you just draw for all of today's class? Play with story cubes? Up to you. Um, okay, we're going to pick whichever we want to. Don't care. Take it off the list. Here's the catch, though. You can never go back to a station after you have done it. And today, unlike the Egg Dash Challenge, where we're playing how many can you get done quickly, you're just playing with Legos for the entirety of today's class. Building what we read last night. Isn't that annotation by another, style, another name? And a sketch noting station, drawing pictures of what you read last night. Go. Text evidence to bear it out. You're not getting graded on how well you can draw. You're getting graded on how much detail you can include. And that comes right from the text. So a student would be like, okay, today we're working on sketch notes. Oh, no, man, no, I don't like that station. We already did that one uh, two weeks ago, and I was really bad at it. All right, let's use the story cubes. By the end of the unit with seven different things, every group will have moved through seven different stations. And I don't really know who's going to win because the games are made up and the points don't matter. At the end of each day, group turns in a work project. Nice work, nice work, nice work. They annotated in four or five different ways. I don't care. I don't know who's going to win, but I only have four work products to look at. So I start to say, okay, at the end of the day, I have four work products. I then rate them against each other, team one, team two, team three, and team four. Next day's class, I start off, congratulations, guys. One of you guys did the gold medal work yesterday. And the winner was, I don't know what the winner was, because again, I'm comparing apples to oranges. I don't know what they're going to turn in. I do know that they're all annotating, but it's looking totally different. But just like whose line where the games are made up and the points don't matter, I say, guys, it was close yesterday, but the team with the Legos had 17 different slides and they were just so beautiful and fully illustrated. Meanwhile, the students who did the, they did a flip grid, they reenacted seven different scenes from the, the movie. And I gotta tell you, it was hilarious. You guys have to watch that as flip grids. Ultimately, they're not competing against me. They're competing against one another and the levels are getting harder as they go because the thing that won a gold medal on day one wouldn't even rate by day two and day three and day four because they're performing for an authentic audience of their peers, right? If you focus on the learning, the grade comes as a consequence. There's an autonomy and there's a sense of, I am getting good at this, but wow, this game is getting much, much harder. I probably need to go home and read a little bit more tomorrow. Oh, I could crush this in the Lego station if I had Legos tomorrow. And through it, they play, they get excited, and they want to come back and see what the next day has to bring. Frozen right back into the book, rinse and repeat. Sometimes we'll play with uh, playful pedagogy, even when we deal with very diff difficult uh, content. And this is an example that comes to us uh, in, my, in my book, or my course, we have to read a, a poem by Sylvia Plath. Uh, it's called Daddy, and it deals with some psychosexual trauma. It would not be appropriate to make a themed game or an amusement park or an escape room that was based on um, psychosexual trauma, um, abuse, self-harm, suicide. Uh, this one deals with imagery borrowed from World War II and the Holocaust. All of these things would not be appropriate for game-based learning. And I would say the same thing to teachers who were teaching things like slavery or the Underground Railroad, uh, Japanese internment during World War II, even things like Black Lives Matter. Just because uh, you can make a game out of it doesn't mean that you should. And in fact, this can cause real damage if you're not careful. Because the low-hanging fruit way to do it is, okay, let's see how many people can escape the Holocaust before. Don't do that. You're making light of these things. And especially as an educator who is white, middle class, cisgendered, and heterosexual, I have to be palpably aware at all times that the people in my classroom may not have the same privilege or the same life story that I have. So be very, very careful that you're never making light of someone's trauma as you make playful learning happen in your classroom. But that doesn't mean that you cannot use playful learning strategies to teach difficult concepts matter. In this case, I just gave students a bunch of dice from a Dungeons and Dragons uh, deck of dice role-playing game dice. I said, roll the dice, add up the total that you got. Whatever the total is, that's the number of words you're allowed to keep in this poem. Circle the words that you think are most important in this poem, then black out everything else. And as you black it out, I want you to reveal to me a picture of what you think the main idea of this poem is based on the words you have left. So using playful strategy, not to make fun of trauma, rather to help students make sense of a very difficult subject matter through something that's more familiar and age appropriate for them. This first example, Jared rolled some dice and came up with whatever he had, 27 words. And it says, daddy, uh, you lied. I thought German obscene, Jew not pure, scared for God, brute devil man, back, back, back. I'm through, killed too, you bastard. Look at this. I didn't teach anything about this poem. I just gave that to the kid and I said, go. How much does he understand based on what he has shown me? Again, really high level interaction. He used the German flag. He uses a woman being oppressed by a man. And he's talking about visual connections that he's seeing coming to life from the words that he had left, almost like an Easter egg hunt. This is what I've discovered out of this poem. Our second one here comes to us from a student who made something that felt like a maze. Um, it borrows from the top to the bottom and it moves. And it says, I do kill you, my Pollock friend, stuck German obscene like a Jew with a brute like you, you bastard. And it ends here with this sort of gaseous, noxious, this sort of claustrophobia, 
our author is dying by suicide uh, as, as the gas comes out of a gas oven, which happened in real life. Um, the student did that research independent of me, not for a grade, just because they were fascinated by what they unlocked and they wanted to see if they can get to the heart of it. Again, it became like a detective story. What was this author writing about? And the idea of gas and asphyxiation and the Holocaust all sort of tying together with a very traumatic thing. Um, the certain student, Eliza, I loved the amount of work these students put in. This one here has a very clear sense of choking. I feel like I can't breathe, right? They got that out of the poem. And yeah, I picked the pretty ones, right? But I can tell you, I have a library of 40 or 50 of these that I started posting on my Instagram. And the National Council of Teachers of English said, can we get copies of all of them? Because they are amazing. We would pay your kids for that. I was like, that's it, right? I did not have to teach a word of these poems, but the students themselves, because they're competing and sharing and showcasing, they want to be seen for what they can discover. Tell them that we're focusing only on the grade. They don't care what they learned. If you focus on the learning, this is the type of work that they'll turn out. This is another example of another unit, uh, talk about autonomy. I said, hey guys, we're studying what it means to be a romantic hero and explore the world like Alexander Hamilton or explore the world like uh, you know Lewis and Clark or Sacagawea. And I said, can you make a, a player card where you tell me uh, what type of player you would be if we were you know, like an action figure joining the world of? So the student here on the right, I noticed he could draw. Um, and that's what made me uh, catch the idea that he was um, like a, a thing worth paying attention to. But what was interesting is he created, created his character who was something of a showman, a bit of a performer. Um, I noticed here, and I zoom in on it, he presented to me a hydro flask with some dope stickers, as he said. And I was struck by this because as a teacher in an English uh, department, rarely do I get to talk about social justice issues, but for the student, social justice was really important. And a teacher in a Catholic school, I rarely get to talk about LGBT issues. And I noticed in this video or in this presentation, this student was uh, identifying as LGBTQ or an ally. And that was because this game created a space where he felt comfortable doing so. How much more am I able to reach this kid because I know that about him. And now there's no blame or shame or judgment. There's no Pokemon achievement gap that black kids learn worse than white kids. But there is an achievement gap in school that we say, well, only white kids can do X, Y, and Z. Games don't care whether you're gay or straight or rich or poor or black or white. Games care what you can do. And that game gives you feedback that says, hey, thanks for sharing that with me. Let's see what I can do to Bring more issues that are of issue to you in this classroom. How much more than he feels safer and supported to keep trying again. That autonomy is so, so important. Um, I talked about autonomy. I'm going to spend the, uh, the last 10 minutes of the presentation here about autonomy into mastery and purpose. Talk about mud runs. Uh, I do mud runs. I realize I need a better hobby, but in my uh, mud run experiences, uh, I find that they're fun because it's a race of me against me. Yesterday, I did a seven mile run with a friend and uh, he's way faster than me, but I'm never racing with him. I'm racing with me, right? So I'm pushing myself to, can I get better than I was last time? And that's what drives you back to it with a little bit of vanity of, hey, I look a little better in the mirror. I can do a little bit stronger. I can push a little harder, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. In fact, it's not just amateur athletes this comes to. In the Olympics, um, there's a great study in a book called The Rise by Sarah Lewis, who I believe is a researcher out of Harvard. Um, it's called Creativity, the Gift of Failure, the Search for Mastery. And talk about uh, medalists in the Olympic Games. They did a long study on people who were at the top of their field. And what they found is statistically, there's no real difference between the gold, the silver, and the bronze medalists, barring rare exception. We're talking about like a hair or a flutter or one foot here or there is the difference between a winner and, a, and someone who doesn't even place. But what was interesting is when they got to the medal platform, the reactions of these performers were night and day. Gold medalists, of course, are glorious and victorious. Bronze medalists are elated to even be on the platform because they almost missed it and they're just happy to be there. But silver medalists, almost without fail, look like Michaela Maroney because they're like, dang it, I was one move away, one inch away, one step away. This is the same psychology in that flow state to how gambling addiction works because people believe if I was just one more swing of that bat, one more roll of those dice, I could have won. I kind of want my kids to go home feeling this way where they're silver medalists just about every day because what they found is that students or performers who get that second place kick themselves so hard into high gear that silver medalists go on to medal again in subsequent Olympics at a higher rate than bronze or gold medalists because they're haunted by this idea of if I just could give this one more shot, then I would get there. That to me is really empowering. So how do I get my kids to come back every day and want to keep working? Answer, once a week, I'll push out a score sheet. It'll come out on Fridays. Hey guys, here's who's in the top of the score, second place in the score, third place in the score. Here's who's got the gold medals, the silver medals, the bronze medals. And I'll present it in what feels like a comic book that comes out every week. It does not have the grades attached to it because again, three teams could get first place, but only one of them gets the gold medal. Eight teams can get A level grades, but only one of them can walk away the victor for the day. And so they're seeing the 
relative rank of how they're performing up against how other students are performing. And then students, because they're seeing it for an authentic audience, right? They're going home and saying, mom, 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 check it out. I got the gold medal this week. Pictures and videos, linked content, quality work products being shared out. And because they want to make it into the top of the list, they start sitting up straighter in class. They start to perform a little better. They say, hey, Mr. Meehan, do you think this is going to get the gold medal today? I don't know. And of course, I'm keeping a quiet track. Hey, I've noticed that I haven't seen from Michael in a few days, and I can give him a little bit of TLC to get him back in the game. But because they feel celebrated and supported, I have all these templates on my website. Please steal them. They're just Microsoft Word documents. Edit them as you need to. Send them out for your uh, students, especially in distance learning. It's a great way to keep those communities connected and families get excited to lean in because it is a lot of work. But I'd rather do a lot of work getting kids excited than getting kids disciplined. They're in. They get that sense of mastery. Like a game of Angry Birds, if you played Angry Birds. You take the bird, you load up the slingshot, sling them across the way. If you knock down the tower in one shot, you get three stars. If it takes you two starts, they give you uh, two shots, they give you uh, two stars. If it takes you uh, three shots, they'll give you just one star. But either way, they'll let you keep moving to uh, subsequent levels until you get to like level 20. Once you get to like level 20, they say, hey, you can keep playing this game any way you want to, but you can't play levels 20 and beyond until you've unlocked 40 stars total. So go back and do whatever you need to do in whatever levels you want to. Again, autonomy to mastery. So if we had a class then that did the same thing, I know our kids play Angry Birds. Could I do the same thing in English class? Probably. I created for them a rubric as they had to do an essay. And it's spoiler, just any old essay. It's not great. I just gave it a little bit of a, a coat of paint on it. I call it the Raiders of the Ancient ORB, like an orb. They're looking for the outside reading book. Isn't that clever? Um, and I give each student a rubric, or I call it here an explorer map. And they have a chance to navigate the twisting chambers of this timeless structure. Spoiler, all the things I'm looking for in the rubric. They can explore it any way they want to. Each time they think they have it, come to the defender of the orb to collect their treasure. Micro-credentialing, micro-checkpoints instead of needing to micromanage. They work at their own pace. So just two weeks in class, we're just writing an essay. And I'll give them the rubric. Here's the rubric looks like. This is everything that would have otherwise been in my traditional rubric. I have, I think, 16 categories here. Each of them are worth four stars or four jewels, whatever it is. So as students are working, I don't care which one they work on, just like we saw earlier with that Montessori school or that egg dash. Um, I don't know, this one here, font and spacing. Paper is written in Times New Roman size 12 throughout using one inch margins, proper title and page headers. Student comes over and says, Mr. Meehan, I wanna check that one. I think I got it. I spot check it right there on the fly. I either know that student, nice work, all four stars, good to go. Or um, you have three of those four things, not quite. I'm gonna mark it as three out of four. You're welcome to check in with me again, or if you want to, you can move on to another, but I'm just gonna let you know right now, this is what it looks like today. If you turn it in, you'd only get three out of four stars. Okay, right. Now they have choice, they have mastery, they have a sense of autonomy, that they can walk away and work on what they need to work on. And I don't care in what order they do it because constantly they're checking with me again and again and again and again. So instead of having a stack of essays piles up once every three weeks, I'm getting feedback to students 15, 16, 30 times before they turn something in. We'll turn into a sort of a game, I'll have the PowerPoint in the background going. Students will have magnet versions of whatever their avatars are for their unit as they explore their way through it. And a clock is tick, tick, ticking away while the Indiana Jones music blares in the background. So I'll say, hey, Sydney, you have six points so far. Nice work. I can see Jonathan has 13 points. Hey, Jonathan, I'm noticing you have some split infinitives in this paper when he's checking in with me. And they're like, what is those? I'm like, you know, that's a good question. Uh, I think I'm going to need you to research that and come back. If you want to get four stars, that's what it's going to take. Jonathan's getting harder questions because Jonathan is racing ahead. It's not fair to treat every student equally because treating every student equally and treating them fairly does not mean the same thing. Meanwhile, Alex here in the bottom, he's just struggling. Maybe he just needs help with subject verb agreement. So I give him an attaboy and I give him a different feedback. And I know already that Jonathan is going to be working on a much harder thing. So by the time that Jonathan comes back in, for Jonathan to do Jonathan's best work, that's not the same as Alex doing Alex's best work. And that's okay. Just like the game sense will slow one student down to get everybody back in the game. At no point does a student feel bullied, blamed, or shamed. Because then I could follow up and say, hey, Chase, we need to talk about it. Or hey, Alex, we need to talk about it. Or hey, Sydney, how are we? Then when we get the grading and it's done at the end of the unit, um, they have to take a look at, okay, here we are. How did I do? Traditional rubric on the left-hand side. I'll take that and I'll turn it into a game as well. Here's what you guys did. But because I don't hate you, your grade for this unit comes 50% from what I found. And it comes 50% from what you think. Take what I have presented to you on the left-hand side, just like we did in our opening challenge, um, and map it here on the grid on the right. So we're creating a spider web graph. Um, I call it a personal record rubric. Um, you might see in this radar plots, whatever it looks like. Chart the information from the left that I gave to you on the right. So the research shows that the person who's doing the reflection is the person who's doing the learning. Now connect those dots. And I'm gonna give you three questions. And again, my grade for you is worth 50%. What you tell me is now worth 50%, so take it seriously. Question one, 
what obstacle right now are you dominating? Which one are you doing a great job with? And tell me why. And I'll ask the questions one at a time so students actually take them seriously, right? Oh, I did really good on sentence structure. I thought I had a nice variety. I did a really good job, subject grammar, grammar, blah, 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 blah. Okay, question two, which of these obstacles has given you the most trouble so far? This kid might say, oh, I'm struggling with bodily paragraphs. Mr. Man, I don't understand it. I keep saying this, but blah, 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 blah. As long as what they're saying with their eyes is meeting what I'm seeing with my eyes, or maybe they're letting me know I'm having trouble because boom, 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 boom. I can give individual feedback and help out accordingly. Because question three is, okay, so how can I help you get unstuck in that thing that's currently sticking you? That's not Bart Simpson writing on the board, I will not throw spitballs at the teacher. It's individual students saying individually, here's what I'm working on and here's where I'm stuck. Talking about a sense of mastery. They do the next essay and it's the exact same assignment. We write for a little bit in class, writer's workshop. They then get their work back to me or from me. They then chart it and this time a different color pen. Now we're talking about Carol Dweck and mindset. They can see signs of their growth, signs of their success because they either were where they were and have grown or were where they were and they're still stuck there. Question one, where are you stuck? Question two, what did you dominate? Question three, what can I help? And they again, rinse and repeat again and again. How much more do I know these students and do they know themselves? So it's not Mr. Meehan's a jerk and that's why I got a B. It's, oh, I don't know how to write body paragraphs. And I can give that same rich data to the next year's teacher. And the students are a part of that conversation. So they feel like I'm not out to change the game on them. Rather, we're playing this game together and I'm trying to coach and move them through it. Talked about autonomy, talked about mastery, and I want to wrap up these last uh, three or four slides here talking about purpose at the end of the year. This is the American dream. We're chasing, we're trying to grow, and we're trying to gain that dream, but it can be scary. And I want to let my students know that the, just because we talk about the American dream doesn't mean that it always goes so pretty. Now, I have to be very delicate, very careful when I talk about certain things that are trigger warnings, whether it was uh, the blaming and the bullying of Hester Prynne or the slavery and the racism of uh, the Mark Twain stories uh, or the Harlem Renaissance or those moments of psychosexual trauma where our students are identifying as LGBT or trauma and self-harm and abuse like we saw in Sylvia Plath. I can't make light of that. So I know that my class ultimately has a purpose because I'm not teaching content, I'm teaching kids. In fact, at the end of our year, I know that we finish in the month of May and we celebrate Mental Health Awareness Month. Um, and I'm at a Catholic school, so we talk about it both through the lens of faith and through the lens of science. So I said, okay, could I make a game that is in no way insulting about the final novel that we read of the year, which is called As I Lay Dying by William Faulkner. It was written in 1929, published the same day that the stock market crashed. And it tells the story of a family who is grieving the loss of their mother. There are seven different people in the family. And the book is told from the perspective of different narrators in each chapter. And each person is in a different stage of grief. It's very, very serious. And it's not something to take lightly. And ultimately, unfortunately, at the end of the book, at least one of these characters, something really, really bad will happen to them. Um, and one of them ends up committed to a mental institution. So it's 1929 and I need my kids to know about life in an asylum, because if you understand what life in an asylum is like, this will hit you like a gut punch at the end of it, but I can't make fun of it. I can't make light of. So can we make a playful attempt to understand some really heavy, heady subject matter? All right, guys, come on in. Good to see you. As you come into our research facility, because now our class is transformed into like a psychological research facility, go ahead and scan your credentials in just like you would have scanned into Johnson & Johnson or Merck. You walk in, you scan your QR code, and just like that, you're learning a new activity, almost like as, a, as an information, like you're scanning your, your, your badge when you walk in the door, and there's a nice warm-up activity there. It's the same activities we would have done with that choice activity, easy, medium, or hard, but now it's just presented individually as students walk in the door. Then rather than competing for gold, silver, and bronze medals, they're working as their team to become, quote, the director or the fellow at the hospital being ranked and rated with their work products. Okay, here's a confidential work file with patient journals or diaries. Spoiler, the chapter from the book. Um, out of the chapter that we're waiting for, there's a different look for item every day. I'll present that work folder and I'll say, as your team, work together, which team can come up with the best answer or solution to whatever the problems that lie inside of that is. Again, borrowing a very light element of game inspired learning here to create that escape room sense of, hey, we can solve this, we can escape this, we can help change this. Not so that we're playing doctor in a creepy way, but rather we're thinking like medical professionals to make professional recommendations and make sense of some really heavy, heady stuff from the text and from the time period. They'll learn about things like the asylum era of the world of the 19th century. And they'll come to find out things like uh, the transorbital lobotomy, where we had to do some really awful medical procedures in an attempt to keep people uh, under control. Talk about taking their American dreams and stealing them. Maybe they'll scan a QR code and learn about all of the reasons why people could have been committed to an insane asylum before 1957 and we had informed consent laws from patients. Now we're talking about using science and STEM in an English classroom and then talking about social justice in a way that's authentically integrated rather than tacked on. This is powerful stuff. So at the end of the year, as we wrap up, rather than doing this thing where we would uh, take a final exam, we take a class trip. 
located four hours from our school is the Trans Allegheny Lunatic Asylum. Um, it is a national historic landmark in West and West Virginia. Um, it was built in 1864 uh, for some 250 uh, residents. By the time it was forcibly closed uh, by the United States government in 1994, uh, which is insane because that's during my lifetime and during the lifetime of most of the people in my building who are not children, um, that place that was built for 250 people at max capacity had over 2,500 people in that same space. So now we're talking about the American dream turning into an American nightmare. Not to leave on a bad note, but quite on the contrary to say, if you are here to change the game, how do we change the game for everyone? We finish our unit, finish our year with, um, students will create for me a website. Um, they, can, they can work independently and they have to create five pages on that website. On page one, make for me a historically accurate uh, asylum for any of the periods we've studied in American literature. What would it have looked like in Huckleberry Finn? What would it have looked like for Hester Prynne? What would it have looked like for The Great Gatsby? What amenities would it have been if it was trying to cater to the people of Boston versus the people of New York, Philadelphia, Washington? Um, and question two, if one of the characters from our own literature found him or herself in those places, how would they be feeling? Talk about that, empathize with them, talk about what they said and thought and use the language that was borrowed from the text that we read to prove that you understand how they felt and why those would have pe people ever would have found themselves in such awful, awful places. Talk about research on page three, tell us where uh, the medical community was at the time. What sort of argument would someone have made to try to commit this person away? Now we're talking about counter arguments and making, uh, taking things apart by taking um, the bad argument and sort of debunking it. Question four, let's use the research of today. We use the DSM-5 and because we're a Catholic school, the catechism, let's talk about what all their alternatives exist so we don't bully, blame, shame, commit, isolate, segregate people. How do we change that world so it never happens again? Can we find professional quality vetted research to make sure that we are doing things that are real to protect real people's lives? And on page five, so what did you learn from this unit, from this class and from this approach to study? And person after person after person comes back and tells me, this brought to life everything that I never cared about, and I can't wait to go on to study law, medicine, politics, advocacy work, social justice. And they come back not just from my class when they're seniors, they come back from college and they say to me, Mr. Meehan, I got involved with XYZ advocacy as a direct result of your class. I began to see that through that fiction, we weren't studying the fake stories of fake people. We were studying about the human condition. And I just like, my heart breaks for them because I'm like, that's why we do what we do. We don't teach content, we teach people. We want those people to feel like they have the chance to change the game. In the end, I'll say the only thing more powerful than content ownership is content authorship, which is, hey, I didn't make this for you. I gave you a sandbox and I showed you how to use the bucket and the shovel and you made something amazing for me. The only thing more powerful than content ownership is content authorship. You helped to co-create this, and now you have a vested interest in seeing it succeed and survive and thrive. And I can't wait to see what kind of crazy cool sandboxes you can build as long as we play together safely. So I have one more slide here, and I'll thank you for your time. I will take questions in the chat. I apologize we ran a little long. I'm sorry there was some sound issues there for, for the middle. Um, I'm on Twitter at MeehanEDU. I would love, love, love to talk further with you on how we can be more empathetic and more aware while still being engaging and exciting. It's not just enough to make fun of education, but to make uh, sense of some really hard topics, whether that's uh, English, math, science, history, world languages. Uh, there's so many ways to tap into playful learning to do it. I have a bunch of templates available on my website at adrenalinerush.com. Um, if you haven't had a chance to check out my book, it's Adrenaline Rush, uh, all about game-changing student engagement, inspired by theme parks, mud runs, and escape rooms. Um, and I do a podcast that comes out every Monday, so that means I have to record it today. It's called Talk to Me in the Car, all about how we can make our classrooms safer and more supported for all learners of all walks of life. Um, please find me on Twitter. Let's hang out afterwards. If you have to bounce, I totally understand. I'm sorry I ran a little bit long. I do appreciate your patience. Um, and I will take questions in the chat. God bless you. Stay safe. Stay home. Wear a mask. Um, and let's change the game together. Um, thanks so much for your time today. And I will bounce back over to the chat to hang out with you there. Let's do this thing where I stop video sharing. Stop video sharing. Stop video sharing. OK, stop video sharing. And then I do this thing where I put the video back on. Hey, that's me. Hi, all. Kathy, all of the slides you saw today are available on my website. Uh, just head over to adrenalinerush.com. It's divided into different pieces and parts, um, different activities over there. Um, I, I will want to make people have uh, the access to whatever modular stuff they need. So if you need like the rubrics or if you need like the, uh, the escape room theme or if you need the, uh, uh, the class trip thing, all that stuff is there waiting for you. Um, likewise, downloadables uh, are there for you. And the presentation of all of today will be on the YouTube channel, uh, Microsoft CUE. So you can check that sucker out um, too.
Um, I'm going to go back here and um, here we go here. Uh, I really appreciate it. Thank you guys so much here. Uh, focus on the learning, not the grade. Yes. Can I share the slides? I hope that answered that one question. Could I use that strategy with so many primary sources? 100%. Um, don't make people pretend to be slaves. Yes. Um, uh, I, I think I, as an educator, you know, words matter. And I've even shifted recently in light of the George Floyd protests and everything else that's going on, which I've been uh, had a chance to be a part of here in Washington. Um, I've even changed my own vernacular. I don't say the word slaves anymore. I just say the word enslaved people, which I know is a small twist, but the fact that I have to force myself every time to say people, they are people. There's a human dignity issue at stake there. And as a Catholic school teacher, I believe firmly in the dignity of every human person, which is not a political issue. That's a human rights issue. So um, yeah, be very, very careful of that. Uh, I really appreciate it. Um, let's see here. Web uh, Adrenaline Rush, so much free stuff. Yeah, being in the game. Yep, that's ready to go. Um, Stranger Things, that one's up there. Um, you can just run a start here. Uh, there was a mute here. I appreciate that. Whose lines in any way? Games are made up. The points don't matter. Um, I appreciate uh, that. I apologize that the, the sound issues were, were up there in a little bit here. Thank you guys for that. Um, as far as how to make these amazing things, you don't even have to make them, just steal them. <laughs> They're for my website, uh, just head to Adrenaline Rush. All the templates are there. Everything was made either in PowerPoint or Google Slides. Um, all the images come to us from a website called Pexels, P-E-X-E-L-S. Those are just big free images of any sort of stock photo you can want. Um, and they're royalty free on purpose, so you can use them in any way you need to. Uh, and as far as the icons go, the icons come to us from a website called The Noun Project. Totally free unless you want to have a subscription. And the subscription has some more features, which I like. Um, but you put in a word and there's an, there's a, there's an icon for it. Coffee cup or you know, pitchfork, whatever you need. Um, so feel free to use those suckers. Adapt them any way you need to. Um, I'm seeing some people are asking about muting. Thank you for your flexibility there. I'm now back down to new messages, answering questions here at the bottom. Let's see, let's see. Thank you guys so much here. Are the directions on how to create the digital time clock? That's a great question, Corinne. Um, I didn't even have to, I stole it from YouTube. I just went to YouTube and found an embeddable clock. Um, and if you're doing like a Google slide presentation, for example, because YouTube is owned by Google and Google slides is owned by Google, you just insert video, that one. Um, if you have it in Microsoft, uh, you just have it like as part of your screen and there's ways to embed there as well. Um, so it's, it's very easy to just grab a YouTube video, search for a countdown clock, ready to go. Um, on the site, if you click the templates, uh, I think it says resources, uh, and underneath resources, uh, Jacqueline, there's a drop down menu. You should see most everything here. Uh, how to adapt them for distance learning? Yes, I do, Kathy. In fact, on Wednesday, I will be giving office hours, and I'm sorry to do the upsell where I ask you to come back, um, but I don't want to uh, dominate too much of your time this morning. Um, but I will be talking entirely about adaptations I've made for distance learning. In fact, on my website, if you want to sneak peek at it, if you don't have a chance to get back on Wednesday, uh, just head to uh, adrenalinerush.com. There's a thing that says distance learning. I have a whole drop down there of distance learning uh, templates available. So yeah, let's go for it. And anything I can do to help. Um, happy, happy, happy to help. Um, this one here from Rachel says, uh, how could we incorporate high school automotive or hard tech in general? Some ideas, but anything you would love to hear. Yeah, hundred percent. So Rachel, a good example, automotive tech, for example, uh, if I'm in a class and now it's a game where we have to, I don't know, I think about there was a game called Days of Thunder for the, the old school Nintendo. And you had to be like the pit crew at a certain point. You had to race around the track and then you had to stop and like you had to put all four tires back on, gas up and then go. It doesn't matter whether you put the left tire on before the right tire, the back and the front, and then the gas. Ultimately, you get good at it at a certain point. You're like, oh, doing the tires on the right side is faster than the left side because I have to put the gas pump in the left side, whatever that looks like. But in the end, you, you move in any order you need to. I wonder if you could adapt one of those uh, break-in style games like the Egg Dash Challenge um, template. Um, on my website, I have a, web, a template I call a QR break in, and it's basically that. It's go around an item fetch quest. I don't care whether you get the rocket pack before you get the time travel machine or whatever that looks like, uh, but grab all of them, and each of these different centers has a different small activity that they'd have to complete. So in what they're doing is, quote, building the car. They had to get the right wheel, the left wheel, the windshield, the fender, the, the muffler, the, the windshield wipers, uh, the antenna, the gas. Each of these different collectibles do in any order they want to, but while they're there, they're learning a little bit about uh, whatever that part of the vehicle is. So perhaps there's a flip grid station where they have to make a short vehicle about, was there difference between a video about uh, difference between a manual and an automatic transmission? Talk for two minutes. And then when they have that flip grid submitted, nice work, good to go, they're able to move on to the next station, et cetera, et cetera. So it's taking what otherwise would have been a lecture or a, a, a staid presentation and presenting it like a, a buffet. Okay, get anything you want to in any order you need to. I don't really care whether they care about mufflers before they care about transmissions. In the end, I know that they've demonstrated that work product because they can't get out of that station until they've completed that activity. 
so I, I do hope that makes sense. Um, but I can I can go back into that and we can talk further. Um, but I hope that kind of gives you at least an idea, Rachel. Maybe question. Um, Becca says the book looks great. Oh, thank you. I arrived, flipped through it as it arrived on Saturday. Uh, I really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Um, and like I said, please let me know. It's a lot of this in more detail. It's like a cookbook version of here's how you can do it. Plug and play. Get those recipes in. Um, Stacy says, what time are the office hours on Wednesday? I believe it's 10 a.m. Eastern because that's what I signed up for um, because I do like to run and occasionally uh, have a few adult beverages in the nighttime. So I don't want to wake up too terribly early. Um, because I have things on this set. So I think it's 10 a.m. Eastern. Um, I will push out things on my Twitter to, to give uh, as much feedback as I can. And that one's way more just conversation. We just sit in, ask questions. Um, I have some distance learning templates that if we're in a pinch, I can throw up in the background and we can talk about it. But um, hopefully we'll get more one-on-one -on -one time. And if you hit me up on Twitter and you say, hey, this is great, but those times don't work for me, just let me know. I'm happy to talk about all of those things too. Uh, Jacqueline, where can we get the recording? I'd love to rewatch this. Yes, and in truth, uh, to kindness to everybody here, no disrespect to anybody. I understand microphone issues, tech issues happen. Uh, I'm not on my A game today. I felt bad because I was. I kept hearing that pop in the background in the middle, so I ran a little longer. I apologize. Um, if you head to the YouTube and just search for Microsoft CUE, I believe there are two different uh, presentations that I've given on their YouTube page. One that's entirely about distance learning, and one that's the presentation you saw today, only a little faster uh, and maybe with a little less distraction. So if that helps, I think that's already up there. Uh, this one will be as well, but um, that one's there for you if you need it. Stacy says, uh, yeah, 10, 10, 10 a.m. Eastern. Um, I really appreciate it. Thank you, guys. Um, oh, 7 a.m. Pacific time. Great. Um, yeah, so that's where we are. Um, and if you all have the bounce, I totally understand. I mean, it's Irish goodbye. If you want to hang out, I'm going to stop the recording now but I will stay and take questions afterwards. Oh, perfect, thank you, Naya, for posting that up there. Uh, there's the link, well, boom. And there are a bunch of them here, um, and not just me, like there are fantastic educators. And what I love, love, love is you can watch things back in double time. Um, so if you're like kind of doing something else around your house, just you know, have it in your ear, uh, tune in for the parts that you needed to pay attention to. That's a great feature uh, of YouTube. I'm gonna stop the recording now. I'm gonna say thank you again, uh, but I will stay and answer any questions you all have um, for, for the next little bit. And I appreciate your flexibility. So I'm gonna hit stop. Say thanks, and I'll see you. And now when I hit stop,